Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Today we're doing a series on common digestive imbalances. The first lesson in common digestive imbalances is the difference between problems with stomach acid and problems with bile. These often occur together and they result in a, a very common symptom, which includes bloating and gas and distension of the abdomen. So if a person has a, a, a digestive problem, one of the things that will happen to them sometimes is a, a feeling of belching where, where gas comes up from their stomach and comes out of their mouth. And so those burping or belching experiences come up. Then there's also gas experiences where we have flatulence. And that's gas that goes down through the intestines and comes out the backside. So when a person has a problem that involves difficulty, we want to ask them several questions. Does the problem begin within minutes of eating? Does the problem begin after 15 minutes of eating? Does the problem begin 15 minutes and, and three hours of eating? And does the problem begin after three hours since eating? Does it happen with small bits of food and little small servings? Or does it happen with only a meal size portion. We want to know, does it produce both belching and flatulence? Or does it produce only one or only the other? And does it produce any changes in stool? Does it produce changes like, um, like constipation or diarrhea or intermittent constipation and diarrhea? Does it give us thick stools? Does it give us floating stools? Does it give us dense stools that sink to the bottom of the, of the bowl? We're going to be talking about all these different issues today. And while it's still safe for work, it's pretty gross. So um, we'll be talking about all these gross things. So the first one is really when a person eats food, the food goes down their esophagus and into their stomach. And once it goes into their stomach, it, it goes into the portion of this digestive system that has stomach acid. And ideally, there would be a release of stomach acid once the food makes it down the tube, which is about 15 minutes to fully make all of it down into the stomach and secrete the stomach acid. There should be an increase in stomach acid and an increase in churning and a, and a beginning of the digestive process from an acid perspective. Now, carbohydrates begin right away from saliva in the mouth, and, and, and that process starts right away. But the acid portion of digesting protein and digesting minerals doesn't really begin until the food hits the stomach. So once it hits the stomach and we have sufficient acid production, if everything goes well, we would begin to really, really break down the protein and the minerals into something that's highly digestible. And then when the stomach has done its digestive process, it'll, it'll empty and into the small intestine. And then the small intestine will receive bile from the gallbladder and it will completely switch over its pH from very acid to very alkaline. And that happens in, in a short section that's about 10 inches long. And so um, that concept of, of switching over from highly acidic to highly alkaline happens very, very quickly. And it's supposed to, it's supposed to be there. It's supposed to be a very chemically violent process that really is quite aggressive. If this process doesn't happen correctly from the, from the first go, which is the stomach acid, then a person doesn't digest their protein. And when you don't digest your protein, you end up with some real problems that involve changes in stool, changes in gas, uh, and changes in distension. Versus a bile problem, and a bile problem is a different kind of problem, where the problem doesn't really begin till after the stomach. So a bile problem usually should begin after the stomach empties. Now, those of you that watch TV shows about murder mysteries and about TV, um, TV dramas about police officers studying dead bodies and, and how long somebody had a, a food in their stomach before they died, these stories talk about a person and they, the, the common, commonality is that it takes about three hours for food to empty from your stomach after you've eaten it. So if they find a dead body and they open up their stomach and they discover that there was a steak in there and some salad and some wine uh, and some chocolate, they might say, oh yeah, that person had eaten within three hours um, uh, of death. On the other hand, if the stomach was empty, whatever food they find would be in the intestine because it had made it out of the stomach. So the convention is that it takes around three hours. It's not exactly, but it takes around three hours for the stomach to empty after a proper size meal. So if your symptoms begin after 15 minutes, but before three hours after eating a full meal, you probably have a stomach symptom. And it's probably somewhere high up in your, your abdomen. If you have a symptom that begins three hours after a meal or later, and it involves all kinds of churning in the, in the abdomen that goes lower and ends up in, in flatulence, 
Very often that is more of a bile problem involving the production of bile, the storage of bile, and the release of bile, and the quality of bile, and of course the reabsorption of the bile in the small intestine and the large intestine. So the consequences of that are going to change the stools. If a person has um, a problem with bile, very often they have a problem with stomach acid too because it's, it's, it's not very easy to have just a bile problem without a stomach acid problem, but plenty of people have a stomach acid problem without a bile problem. So we have to review some of these things. Now, one of the things that'll happen with a, with a patient or an individual is where is the gas collected? If the problem is a stomach acid problem, they will usually collect gas in the stomach. If they have a problem in indigestion later on in the small intestine and large intestine, they'll produce gas in either the small or much more likely the large intestine, although it can happen in the small intestine in something called SIBO, which we'll get to, um, they, that will end up being flatulence and come out of the backside. That type of gas can be assessed using a stethoscope. Now, you can buy a stethoscope for $8. They are incredibly inexpensive. They're cheap, cheaply made. You can buy expensive ones. A cardiac stethoscope that's much higher quality, but still purely mechanical is over $100. And you can do this on your own and, and listen to yourself and your family. And usually as we, as we listen to the abdomen, we can start to hear and understand, you know, stomach sounds, which are usually going to be right here on the upper left side of the abdomen and making it into the chest area. The small intestine is largely going to be the middle of the belly. We'll do a whole nother session on physical examination. But right now, just suffice to say that the small intestine is kind of the center of the belly. And then the large intestine is a ring around the, the belly which often goes up quite a bit high, crosses over, curves around and goes back down again. So it's quite a large area around the abdomen. And, and that area, you can also hear gas with your stethoscope. One of my favorite methods to do during physical examination is to turn the patient on their sides and let them rest for a minute, minute and a half, and the gas will go up. So if they're laying on their left side, the gas will rise to the right. If they're laying on their right side, their gas will rise to the left. If they're lying on their back, the gas will rise to the surface of their belly. If they're sitting up on an incline, the gas will rise closer to their chest. And if they're lying on their uh, stomach, the gas will rise to their back, um, toward their back, which is hard to hear through the, through the spinal muscles, but it's, it, it will help you figure that out. Getting back to the issues of these problems, one of the biggest leading causes of irritable bowel syndrome is bile disturbances. If you read the literature, you'll see that there are just tons and tons of scientific articles that are peer reviewed and indexed that describe that most of these large intestine problems, especially the ones that, that result in an irritable bowel syndrome or that result in a intermittent diarrhea and constipation effect, that those are caused by problems with bile and gallbladder. So the gallbladder is a little organ that's just a bag, and its job is to, is to concentrate and store bile that's produced by the liver and pancreas. And this bile material uh, is collected and concentrated and water is removed from it and then the individual has this storage of this, this emulsifying fluid that can, can break down fat, much like soap would in your sink when you put soap into a greasy sink. It disperses and distributes the grease. So when you have a good gallbladder, you'll store all of that bile and then you'll release it and it'll go down a tube and come out into the small intestine right after the stomach. Not in the stomach, but right after the stomach. So after the stomach's done its three hours of digesting and secreting, then the food um, bolus will go into the small intestine where this bile is. That bile will meet the, meet the acidic, acidic chyme from the stomach, which is the name of that fluid, and it will flip it over from acid to base, acid to alkaline. And the pH, of course, will shift from very low to very high. That's, that's acid to base. The, um, the acid in the stomach might be 2.0, which is the, the acidity of lemon juice or acids you can buy commercially and industrially in, in, in jars. Very, very strong acid. And then it will flip over to a very powerful alkaline or what, what's similar to a, at home what you might use as lye. Lye is a sodium hydroxide solution that's very alkaline, the opposite of acid, but also very strong, also very corrosive. So this is what will happen in the, in, the, in the small intestine with the bile release. Bile itself is about 94% lecithin. And lecithin is um, the simple emulsifier. It comes from all kinds of foods, nuts and seeds and, and all kinds of, of materials that we eat. Are, and we concentrate this lecithin and make bile out of it. Once we release this bile, it circulates through our, our intestinal system, through the small intestine into the large intestine, and it helps to digest and break down our food. Now, Actually, I should say it ends at the small intestine and it's reabsorbed at the end of the small intestine 
which is, you know, more than 20 feet of length. And at that point, the, at the end of the small intestine, before the large intestine, the bile should be reabsorbed. About 95% of human bile is reabsorbed and reused again many, many times. The problem with that is if we have toxic bile that has bound to heavy metals or bound to toxic solvents or bound to other man-made chemicals in, in our foods, we recycle that toxic bile, we reabsorb it. It goes through our, what's called the hepatic portal circulation. It comes out, it goes to your liver and your liver gets a chance to recycle that again and use this, this reabsorbed uh, bile. And then once your liver has, has re reproduced this bile again and, and recycled it, now you're using again this used toxic bile. So people can have problems with toxic bile and they need to get rid of it. Normally we get rid of our toxic bile through lots and lots of fiber. That's not always the best thing. And there are some, there are some drawbacks to fiber that we'll get to, but the typical process is large amounts of surface area, not necessarily fiber, but surface area of undigested food, which could be something like charcoal, it could be something like clay, and there's, there's again, drawbacks to each of those and advantages to each of those, but the, um, the idea is surface area is something that these little bile particles can adhere to and be carried out of your body in the stool. Once that's carried out of the body in the stool, it can no longer be reabsorbed, and so you have to make new bile from lecithin that you eat in your diet. So it's important to have a track of how your intestines are doing. That is the first round of digestive disturbances showing some differences between stomach and bile. Just to review, the stomach problem happens in the stomach. It's within three hours of eating. It's usually low stomach acid. A bile problem usually gives you symptoms three hours after eating when the food empties the stomach and goes into the small intestine. And then the bile is reabsorbed with the food in, in the later part of the small intestine before the large intestine. And yet, Many symptoms of the large intestine, like irritable bowel syndrome, come from faulty bile, even though the bile doesn't usually make it to the large intestine. Once in a while, bile does make it to the large intestine and comes out, and it usually burns, and, and it bur burns on exit, and that's a, a feature of bile because it's so alkaline. And so um, sometimes you'll see that people will suddenly expel a bunch of bile, and it's usually greenish to yellowish in color. It comes out and changes the stool from a brown color to a green or a, or a yellow color. And uh, in many cases, if you have ineffective bile, you won't emulsify your fats, and so your stools will float, and your, your stools may have a sheen of, of oil in the toilet water after a bowel movement because there is undigested fat. This is not particularly a greasy stool, but it's more of a fatty stool, and it tends to float, and, and again, leaving that oily uh, residue. If the problem is in the stomach, the undigested food ends up very different than, than what happens with the gallbladder. If you don't have enough stomach acid, you can't digest your protein. If you can't digest your protein, you end up getting a very dense, heavier than other food and heavier than water stool. And that stool will sink. And it will usually tend to be pencily thin when it comes out. It doesn't have an expansive property to it. it it's not a very thick stool. It's a very narrow stool, very much like a pencil or a pen which is also a warning sign for colon cancer, by the way. As the stool comes out, sometimes it'll come out in pieces and sometimes it'll come out in, in long strands. In most cases, if it's undigested protein, it will sink to the bottom of the bowl in, in the toilet. And it also leaves greasy tracks and streaks in the, um, in the ceramic. The protein is very sticky. Unlike oil, it's very sticky and it sticks to the ceramic and it will be difficult once it dries to clean off. So if you've, got a, if you've got a toilet that's got lots and lots of fecal matter that's hard to break off and you have to chip it off, chances are that there's someone who has undigested protein using that toilet. So um, you'll, you'll learn those lessons when you, um, when you clean toilets in a facility. But um, that's actually a very necessary thing is to understand that the stools that are from maldigestion of gallbladder uh, and bile and fats are very different than the maldigestion that happens just from a person who has low stomach acid. So with low stomach acid, you won't be able to absorb a lot of your minerals, you won't be able to absorb your protein, and you'll have these heavy stools, you'll have more constipation, you'll have thicker stool, you'll have feeling of incomplete emptying, you may have a need for lots and lots of toilet paper to clean yourself because there's not a clear end to the bowel movement, it doesn't feel like it ever finished, there may be more gummy, sticky fecal matter inside you that doesn't come out. On the other hand, with the gallbladder problem, the person often has bouts of constipation and diarrhea. They often have floating stools. 
and they often have stools that come out in very small pieces because they uh, have lots and lots of fat in their stool. Whereas the person with the stomach acid problem doesn't usually have the problems with the fat. So that's the end of our introduction. Our next one will go into more detail. <laughs>